and kind of pick up with what we were talking about last week in the study of the Godhead. And really my goal, and I know it might not seem like he's on, Ricky asked me this morning, how many parts are you looking at? And I go, well, at least two, because you've got to end on a, you know, we're on, this is part nine. We've got to end on 10. But then again, maybe 18, 20, I don't know, <laughs> just ongoing. But it's something that I'm, I, I got into looking at personally uh, uh, several years ago. And as we were, the theme of this year kind of, has been things that Paul anticipates and expects you to know in Scripture. This fits that uh, category as we've been looking at the relationship amongst the Godhead and then the exhortation in Philippians 2 that we too have the mind, the same mind. Verse 5, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Philippians 2, 5 there. Verse 6, who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found and fashioned as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And again, we've been down looking at this passage specifically as the Apostle Paul here declares to us the, the activity and the lifestyle, the relationship of the Godhead and he does it by focusing in on the Lord Jesus Christ, the head of the body, our Savior. And when we see what the Lord does, then that tells us, gives us an idea of what we're to be doing and how we are to be. Now, we will never do it like him because he was perfect, okay? But we can sure enough work towards being some, looking like, reflecting that issue. When, when, when Paul in Ephesians 5 says, husbands love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for he knows that husbands can never love, the, love their wives the way God, Christ loved the church. But what can we do? We can reflect that love, see, and give, how did he give himself? 100%. So then what are we doing as husbands? So there's an issue here of reflecting. And as we've seen the Lord do some things here he's never done before. He willfully, he, he's, he willingly chooses to do some things in his incarnation, in his humanity. As God, verse 6, he's equal with God. He has no problem. He's not robbing God to be God. He's not doing any of that. And, and so then in his humanity, he willingly self-imposes some limitations. And, and we begin to look at all of that last time. We looked over at Hebrews 5, and where he's going to learn obedience by the things which he suffered. So there's some learning here. And again, he doesn't stop being God. Rather, he willingly chooses not to exercise his independent rights as God. He says, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to come now and do the will of the Father. And he willingly, willfully, independent, selfishly, if you will, do, is doing the will of the Father. He could have easily said, nope, not going to do that. I'm going to do this. And he would have been right in doing it. But it's not what he did. He did something he's never done before. He's becoming obedient. And just by the very language uh, we saw, come over to John 8. We'll just get into it. We saw last time, again, Hebrews 5, and here in John 8, we saw the Lord learning from the Father, the very language. And I want to pick up on where we were last week about him learning. He learned obedience. Philippians 2, he became obedient. And really, literally, how did he learn? The fact is, is that he had to learn some things from the Father. And there's going to be two ways we're going to look this morning as the time will allow us on him learning. Because next week, I want us to look at that issue of being obedient unto death, even the death of the cross, okay? And because that is so powerful, when you understand what he knew was coming his way, and he willingly was born of Mary, became a, a man, walked the earth, accomplished the Messiah scriptures, fulfilled all of that, and then he goes and he dies. And he does it willingly, willfully. He just, this is what the Father said, this is what we're going to go do it. But he does it 
with the confidence of God the Father honoring his word to him. And that brings us here where Christ in his humanity, he's learning from the Father. By the way, it's a real education. It's real learning. It isn't, oh, just fluff and stuff and fill up pages. He's really doing John 8, verse 26. And you see that from the very conversation, the very language used here. John 8, verse 26, I have many things to say and to judge of you. The Lord's talking to the the disciples there. But he that sent me is true. And I speak to the world those things which I have heard of him. They understood not that he spake to them of the Father. Then said Jesus unto them, When ye have lifted up the Son of Man, then shall ye know that I am he, and that I do nothing of myself, but as my Father hath taught me, I speak these things. And he that sent me is with me, the Father hath not left me alone, for I do always those things that please him. Very clear. Look at what the Lord said he's doing. He's not over here tooting his own horn. He made himself of no reputation. He doesn't quit being God. He doesn't empty himself of deity. He says, you know what? I've chosen not to exercise my rights and privileges and benefits as God in this moment. I am rather doing and obeying the word of him that sent me. Who sent him? The Father did. So when you begin to think about this issue of how it is that the Son learned, how then does the Father teach the Son? Well, Two ways the son learns. So the question is this morning, how is it that the son learns? First way, direct revelation from the father. The father's going to provide direct revelation, direct information to the son that he's going to need to accomplish and to do. And then the second is going to be the son is going to learn from the written scriptures, the Old Testament prophets, the volume of the book. Direct Revelation 826. I have many things to say and to judge of you, but he that sent me is true, and I speak the world, the world to the world, those things which I have heard of who? Him. Who sent him? The Father. The Son says, The Father told me, and I'm telling you. And there's a system of information that the Father is going to communicate to the Son, to the Messiah of Israel. And then he turns and communicates it to the believing remnant or to the apostate Israel as they need to be instructed. Come back with me. We did these last time just so you get it in your mind. Isaiah 50 and Psalms 40. Just quickly here, Isaiah 50, just so we get this back into our thinking as we think about this and as we move through this. Isaiah 50 and Psalms 40. Isaiah 50, uh, verse number 4. Isaiah 50, verse 4. The Lord God hath given me the tongue of the learned. The Lord God, Jehovah the Father, hath given me, the Son, the tongue of the learned, that I should know how to speak a word in season to him that is weary. He wakeneth morning by morning. He wakeneth my ear to hear as the learned. What's he being? He's being educated by the Father. Morning by morning, in the cool of the day, in the cool time, the Father and the Son pray. You know, it's interesting. The disciples come to the Lord and say, teach us to pray. Like John taught his disciples, teach us to pray. And the Son, you know, he does. He, uh, Matthew 6, he gives them the Lord's Prayer, you know, what is called the Lord's Prayer, the Our Father Prayer and so forth. But you know what, though? Later on, he'll say, you guys sit right here. I'm going to go over here, and I'm going to pray to the Father in the garden. They have been witnessing the Lord talking to the Father all three and a half years. What is prayer in the Bible? Talking to the Father about the details of life and how to apply his word to those details. That's all it is. It's not, the, the son never begged for anything. He just says, hey, here's what's going on. All right, Father, teach me. I've got the ear of the learn. I've got the tongue of the learn, my ear to hear. Verse 5, the Lord God hath opened my ear. I was not rebellious, neither turned away my back. That is what the nation of Israel, the whole, the totality of, did. 
they became rebellious, and they did turn their back. Matthew 13, it's, it's very clear. I gave my back to the smiters and my cheeks to them that plucked off the hair. I hid not my face from shame and spitting. For the Lord God will help me, therefore shall I not be confounded. Why wasn't he confounded? Why wasn't he all worked up? Why did the Lord, when, when Judas and the boys come into the garden to get him, he's not all anxious? Because the word of the Father has what? Here's what's going to happen. Here's how you're going to respond. And here's the end result. He got it. Believed it. Bam, bam. Walk by faith. Psalms 40. Psalms 40, verse 6. Sacrifice and offerings thou didst not desire. My ears hast thou opened. Burn offering and sin offering hast thou not required. You see, his, in his incarnation, in his humanity, his ears were what? Opened. The tongue of the learned. He's being educated. Verse 7. Then said I, lo, I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me. I delight to do thy will, O my God. Yea, thy law is within my heart. What's he? He's learning the issues. He's being educated. The, ed, the, inform, the Father is educating. I love that. The volume of the book, it is written of who? Of me. I'm being educated by the Father. He's educating me on face-to-face. Uh, -face. And then number two, there's information already made available in a book that the Holy Spirit has caused to be written. And the Holy Spirit has caused passages to be written that are going to identify the Messiah of Israel and the Messiah's identification. The Lord's going to study that and then come over here and say, that passage is talking about me. I'm that passage. I've got the education from the Father, and guess what? Here's the book, and the book says, that's me. And guess what? That is me. See? And he does, he says that. And he recognizes that. Come back with me to John chapter 1. So what Jesus Christ is going to do is he's going to receive the information directly from the Father. By the way, that information is not available in the prophetic scriptures. There's going to be some things directly given to the Lord that he's going to turn and teach that little flock that isn't set in the prophetic scriptures. If you want some illustrations of that, go look at Matthew 13 and the seven mysteries of the kingdom. Those seven mysteries do not sit in the Old Testament. They only sit in the earthly ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Well, all right, you're looking at me funny. Matthew 13. Well, it's okay. It's why I reserve the right to leave the list. Matthew 13. See, you have to understand something, that there's things happening in the earthly ministry of the Lord that come up that the Father is directing him. Matthew 13. Verse 1, the same day when went Jesus out to the uh, of the house... And sat by the seaside. Verse 3. And he spake many things unto them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went forth to sow. All right? Verse 10. And the disciples came and said unto him, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? He answered and said unto them, Because it's an easy way to teach them what's really going on. No. Because it is given unto you. Who? the little flock, the disciples, to know the mysteries of the kingdom, but to them it is not given. Isn't that interesting? There's a whole part of the nation of Israel that don't get the parables. That little flock get it. So he gives them the seven, the, the mysteries of the kingdom. And you know where? You go back. I've looked. If you can find it back there, I'll be glad to hear you out. But they're not back there. You know why if they were back there, do you know who would understand it? That apostate nation. And it isn't for them to understand it. Who's it belong to? That believing remnant. The ones in whom he will give the kingdom to. The believers. Fear not, little flock, it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Those members of the little flock, see. 
if it was back here in the Old Testament, they could do what Herod did with them when the wise men showed up and said, what are they talking about, king of the Jews being born in Bethlehem? And the chief priest said, oh, there's a little verse back here about Bethlehem Judah being something, you know. See, they would have known it. They don't know it. So he begins, now go back to John 1. <laughs> okay, so that's why I said what I said there. What is the Lord doing? He's receiving information from the Father that's not available in the prophetic scripture. Then he's giving that in, then he's going to invest in a lifelong learning process where he's going to study the scriptures. And when, where he learns not only who he is, but also how he's to conduct his ministry and what's the result of it. He begins to learn that. Now, John 1, just notice an illustration here real quickly of John the Baptist, verse 6. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. Okay? So we have John, John the Baptist. Who sent John? God the Father sent John. Verse 6. 32, by the way, John 8, who sent the Son? God the Father did. You're in John 1, verse 32. And John bare record saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it abode upon him. That's the, that's the Lord. And I knew him not, but he that sent me to baptize with water the same, what? Said unto me. Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same as he which baptizes with the Holy Ghost. And I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God. John the Baptist sent by the Father, and the Father speaks to John and says, the only, here's what, when you see this happen, that's the Messiah. So the only way to identify the Messiah was for the, for the Father to say something to John the Baptist. See that? No other way to identify the Messiah without OJB being there saying what he's getting what he got. That's direct revelation from the Father. Do you remember the Lord asked that question? Who do they say I am? And Peter says, you're the, you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. And he says, that's, been, that's good, well said. And he revealed that to you. And now I say unto you, and off you go, see. Come over to chapter 7 of John. You see, direct revelation here, folks. This is, not unnorm this is not unusual. This is a norm, if you will. Uh, by the way, John wasn't surprised <laughs> because his dad knew what was happening. And you, gotta, you, can't, you can't forget something here. John the Baptist's parents, Elizabeth and Zacharias, they were Levites. They were priests. They understood what was happening. You go read Luke 1 and the great exhortation that, that uh, Zacharias, John's dad, pronounces there about not only John, but about the Lord, the one who he's going to identify as Messiah. But so did Mary. So, Mary. so you think about the parenting. What were they doing to these young men, little boys? They had the book in front of them. Here's the Old Testament scriptures. Here, let's read this. Hey, John, you are Isaiah. You are Malachi 3.1. You are who these are. This is you. And here's how we know. Boom, 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 boom. You see, they weren't just sitting over there playing tiddlywinks with the pickup sticks. They weren't just over there build, you know, the tinker toys and playing and goofing around. They had in front of them the Word of God. I get ahead of myself. Where did I tell you? John 7. Number next. That's going to help with the Lord here in just a minute. John 7. John 7, verse 16. Jesus answered them. Verse 14. Now about the midst of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and taught. And the Jews marveled. So what's Jesus doing? He's teaching. The Jews marveled, saying, How knoweth this man letters, having never learned? When they say that, you know what they're saying? He didn't, they didn't go to our school. He doesn't have our diploma. So he didn't learn. He, he's just a carpenter's son. How does he know this? Jesus answered them, verse 16. My doctrine is not mine, but his that sent me. Isn't that interesting? The, he looks at those guys and he says, I'm not telling, my doc, this isn't mine, this is the Father's. By the way, if it was mine, I'd have mowed you down a long time ago. <laughs> or I don't know, he doesn't say it, we don't know, but 
you kind of think about it. If any man will do his will, the Father's will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of... Isn't that interesting? He's like, this is not my opinion. This is not mine. This is the Father's. So what did he have to have? Direct revelation from the Father. Come over to chapter 12 of John. I tried to stay in one book to help you, okay? John 12 and verse 49. John 12, 49. For I have not spoken of myself, but the Father which sent me. He gave me a commandment, what I should say and what I should speak. Not mine. The Father's sent me. And you know what the Father told me? He gave me what I should say and what I should speak. The Lord gives all the credit to the Father. Verse 50, by the way, and I know that His commandment is life everlasting. Whatsoever I speak, therefore, even as the Father said unto me, so I speak. When Jesus, when the Father gave the Lord information, He then is communicating it directly to the believing remnant, to the little flock. By the way, we're the night before Calvary here. He's gone into the upper room, chapter 13, 14, 15, and 16, all in the upper room, the night before the cross. And one of the last things he says to the group as whole is, everything I've been telling you isn't mine, it's his, it's the Father's. And if you believe me, then guess what you're going to believe? The Father. You with me? He's learning it right from the, the Father. Chapter 14. He's communicating it to the believing remnant, that little flock about the kingdom. He's setting the little flock, the 12, and the little flock in place. And all of that setting and doing is the doctrine from the Father. John 14, interesting verse stuck here, verse 24. He that loveth me not keepeth not my sayings, But the word which ye hear is not mine, but the Father's which... You see that word? That's not just generally any word. That is very specific. Back up in verse 10. Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me. He doeth the works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very works sake. You see, the word, they're not my words, guys. And again, not just in, hey, how you doing this morning? You're looking good, you know. Very specific things dealing with the kingdom dealing with the little flock, being the ruling nation, being the nation of God, being the Israel of God. Not all that apostate out there. All that's going to be taken away and cast the wheat and the chaff, the, all of that information, very specific. And he says, you know what? They're not mine. They're his. John 17, in the upper room, they come out. Their head, th- by the way, John 17, this is the real Lord's Prayer, okay? He's, again, praying to the Father. Verse 1, these words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify thy Son that thy Son also may glorify thee. As thou hast given me power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given me, and this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God in Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. You know what eternal life is? It's to know the Godhead. That's eternal life. Now look at verse 4. I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. What work? Did he give, did the Father give the Son to do? This is not Calvary, by the way. He hasn't been to Calvary yet. So that's not the work. What's the work? Verse 5, And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. 
Man, that's an interesting thing. See, he knows who he is at this point. But what's the work of verse 4? How about verse 6? Here's the work. I have manifested thy name unto the men, that's the 12 apostles, which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. The work that the Father gave the Son was to communicate the Father's word, the doctrine to that 12, to the believing remnant, about who the Father was or is and who He is, Messiah. Verse 8, For I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them and have known surely that I came out from thee, and they have believed that thou didn't send me. The Father, he's in, the Father has entrusted the words of doctrine to the Son and the Son to communicate to the believers just as he does today as he has entrusted the Word of God through the Apostle Paul to the church, the body of Christ, to the believers to be carried out and to be believed and functioned. Same system, two different programs. By the way, verse 14, I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Man, I have done the work. I gave them your word. I educated them. I did what you told me to do. I said what you said for me to say. I've done it. Paul says the same thing, by the way. Ephesians chapter 3. What does he say? As I wrote a four, uh, on your way to Hebrews, stop in Ephesians 3. Ephesians 3, verse 1, For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, if you've heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given me to you, how that by revelation he, this will be the Lord Jesus Christ, made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in a few words, whereby when ye read ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. What did he do? God, the Son gave it to me. I've given it to you. He's entrusted it to us for our orderly maintenance and for our belief. So how was the Lord... Come on over to Hebrews. We've got to get going here. Chapter 10. <clears throat> Hebrews 10. So how was the Lord taught? How did he learn obedience by the things which he suffered? Well, first, the Father educated him. The Father comes in and there's direct revelation, there's direct communication between God the Father and God the Son about what the Son in His humanity is going to accomplish. Do you know what that means? That means the Lord willfully and intentionally, deliberately does not exercise being God. Because doesn't God know everything? Yeah. But the Lord obviously, you remember we looked at those last week, hey, how long has the kid been sick? Who touched me? He's demonstrating the limitations of humanity because he is now becoming the personification of perfect man, perfect Adam. You want to see what man should have been doing the whole time? You're going to look at the Lord Jesus Christ. What did he do? Everything the Father told me, that's what I've said, done, and so forth. Okay? Second step, Hebrews 10. Because his, and this one's so much help, so great for you and I. Because God the Father ain't talking to you. <laughs> okay? The second source of his education is from the prophetic scriptures, from the written scriptures. Hebrews chapter 10, verse number, well, verse 5. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world. Wherefore, when he cometh. See this, when he cometh. There's a timing element here. He saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body thou hast prepared for me. Last time we looked at Psalms 40, we compared. It wasn't a body in Psalms 40. It was opening my ear. And the reason that a body was prepared for him, and the reason he can go and taste death for all men, we'll see next week, is because he opened his ear to be, to be taught. If he doesn't open his ear, if he turns his back and he rebels, there's no sacrifice offered. He opened his ear. In burnt offerings and sacrifice for sin, thou hast no pleasure. Then said I, lo, I come. In the volume of the book it is written of me to do thy will, O God. 
the volume of the, verse 9, then said he, lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He take it away, the fir- uh, take away the first that he may establish the second, by the which will we are sanctified through, by the which will, what will? The vo- to do thy will, O God, the Father's will. We are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. There's that Titus 1, 2, the sacrifice, the, the redemption plan has come to... How, how in the world does that redemption program... It's by the will of the Father. He set it forth. It's His will. It's His... And the Son comes and He says, you know what? In the volume of the book. So the Lord Jesus Christ, by making Himself of no reputation, by entering into humanity's limitations... He does what the perfect human is to be doing, the will of the Father. He's delighting in doing that will. How? By the volume of the book, by the written word of God. The volume of the book. Now, in the volume of the book, the volume of the book is pretty big, isn't it? But the scriptures... He's specific information here. There's specific written information in regards to the identity of Israel's Messiah. And then the eventual offering of the Messiah as the sacrifice. And the Lord Jesus Christ will personally claim to be the one who's fulfilling those specific passages. Come over to Luke 2. Luke chapter 2. You have to think this through carefully here. And you have to think about what the Lord's doing in connection with the prophetic scriptures. Seven times the Lord speaks from the cross. Each time he speaks, it is in direct fulfillment of a psalm or a prophet or something the Old Testament said he was going to say. How did he know that? Well, he's God. No, in his humanity. He studied it. He's learned it. He spent a life learning the scriptures. And it starts at a very young age. Luke chapter 2. In Luke 2 and verse 40. And the child grew and waxed strong in in spirit filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. Now, isn't that interesting? Here's the Lord Jesus Christ, and what is he doing? The child did what? Grew and waxed strong in spirit, filled with wisdom. Verse 52 And Jesus, you see how in verse 40 it's child, and in verse 52 it's Jesus? Because he's now had his bar mitzvah. He's 12 years old when this happens. He's come of age now. He's had his bar mitzvah. He's not a child anymore. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. How did he do that? Well, how about mom, Mary, kept in front of him the Old Testament? Come back in chapter 1. And see, this is where you begin to need to understand Mary and what's happening in a Jewish home at this time. By the way, Luke 2 is the only place we see anything of his childhood. You know why we don't see him playing with tinker toys and all that? Because it does not matter to him being the Messiah of Israel. It doesn't matter. He had a normal childhood. He had a normal birth. He had normality. Why? He's human. He's learning. He's growing. Luke 1, you start in verse 46 down to 56, and Mary walks through Malachi 3, Psalms 111, Psalms 103, Psalms 89, Psalms 107, Psalms 98, Psalms 105, Psalms 132, Job 40, Exodus 15. She walks him right down through in her own thinking. What do you think she's doing? She's recognizing who that child that's going to be born is. So what do you think she did? Here, son, read this passage. Isaiah 11. 
Come back to Isaiah 11. You see, he's personally learning from the written word of God, Isaiah 11. Isaiah 11. Isaiah 11, verse 1. Isaiah 11, verse 1. And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse and a branch, capital B, the Lord Jesus Christ, shall grow out of his roots, and the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord." and shall make him of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord. And he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither uh, reprove after the hearing of his ears. All talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. What's he going to do? He's personally learning, studying, growing. And as the Spirit provides the tremendous details from the written word regarding not only who he is, what he's going to do, but rather how he's going to do it, and then what will happen. Come over to Isaiah 48. He's studying all of this, folks. How do you think you and I can do? By the way, when you read some of this, you go, wait a minute, that's King David and that's Israel. You know what? Yes and yes, but it's also who? The Lord. Who's the capital B? The branch. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. But Israel's going to do it. David's going to. So you're going to go, oh, but it's all three. Yes, it is. Why? Because it's who we're talking about. Isaiah 48, verse 16. Come ye near unto me, hear ye this. I have not spoken in secret from the beginning. From the time that it was, there am I. And now the Lord God and His Spirit hath sent me. Who's speaking? Jesus Christ is. He says, you know what? I'm Him. The Father sent me, by the way, verse 12, Hearken unto me, O Jacob, and Israel my called. I am he, I am the first, I also am the last. In verse 16, you've got God the Father, God the, the Holy Spirit working with and in God the Son. you got them all there. And he says, you know what? I haven't spoken in secret. From the time there was, I, there am I, and now the, his Spirit has sent me. I'm doing, I'm right here where the, chapter 49, verse 1, Listen, O isles, unto me, and hearken ye people from afar, from far. The Lord hath called me from the womb. From the bowels of my mother hath he made mention of my name. And he hath made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of his hand hath he hid me, and hath made me a polished shaft in his quiver, Hath he hid me and said unto me, Thou art my servant, O Israel, in whom I will be glorified? Wait a minute, who's the servant? He took on the form of a servant. Is this Israel? Yes. Is this the Lord Jesus Christ? Yes. Then said I, verse 5, And now saith the Lord that formed me from the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob again to him through Though Israel be not gathered, yet shall I be glorious in the eyes of the Lord, and my God shall be my strength. When you read that passage, you ought to think about the Lord Jesus Christ, because that's talking all every piece about Him. He looks at that and He says, you know what? That verse is talking about me. Is it talking about Israel? Yes. But it's also talking about the Lord Jesus Christ, because who is He? True Israel. Come over to Luke chapter 18. You see, folks, the Lord learned not only from the Father in His humanity, not only from directly talking to the big guy in the sky, as the, as the Bible, Hawaiian Bible said, but He's talking to the Father directly, but He's also reading those scriptures. Luke 18. Luke 18 is a wonderful passage. Verse 31. Luke 8, by the way, this is a passage that you ought to have memorized to understand that the Jews, Israel, the little flock, never, ever, 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 never, never, ever, 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 ever preached 
that their sins were going to be forgiven by the death on the cross. Now, eventually, they understand that in the kingdom, but not before that. They understand that through the revelation given to the Apostle Paul, but never before it because of a passage like this. Three times in Mark, he, he tells them, I'm going to go die and be resurrected. I'm going to go die and be resurrected. And they're like, no, 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 no. 18.31, then he took unto him the twelve and said unto them, Behold, we go to Jerusalem. Now watch. And all things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man shall be accomplished. Psalm 16, Psalms 22, Psalm 69, Isaiah 50, Isaiah 53, Isaiah 52, all of it is going to be accomplished. How does he know that? He's been studying it. He's been reading the Old Testament. He read Isaiah 53 and said, that's me. That passage is talking about me. He read Isaiah 49, Isaiah 48, Isaiah. He says, that's me. I'm doing that. I'm matching that up. By the way, verse 32, for he shall be delivered unto the Gentiles and shall be mocked and spitefully entreated and spit it on. Isaiah 50, Isaiah 52, Isaiah 53, and they shall scourge him and put him to death. And the third day he shall rise again. And they understood none of these things. And this saying was hid from them. Neither knew they the things which are spoken. They are not looking forward to the cross. They don't even get it. If words on the page mean something, and they do. Come over to chapter 24 of Luke. What is he telling them? Hey, I got to go. And what I'm going to go do, I'm not doing it because I want to go do it. I'm doing it because that book says I got to go do it. And that book is talking about me. Luke 24, verse 25. Then said he unto them. Now again, who is he talking to? The apostles. Actually, he's talking to the two on the road to Emmaus. Verse 25. Then said he unto them, the two on the road, the certain women, and so forth. O fools and slow of heart, to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. He goes back, he says, you know what? That passage is about me. He goes back to Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, and says, I'm that seed of the woman. That's me. He looks over and he says, Abraham, you're going to go down, you're going to, and there's going to be a deliverer come for your people. That's me. He looks over at Moses and he says, Moses is a picture of me. He goes over there in Isaiah 9 and Isaiah 13, and he says, I'm going to heal the lame and, and heal the sick and cause the blind to see. I'm going to do all of those things. And when John the Baptist's disciples come and say, hey, old John wants to know why you're not letting him out, and are you really the Christ? He says, listen, you tell John to pay attention to the Old Testament because I'm fulfilling it, and that's me. He says, that's me. Verse 44. After the resurrection, and he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the Scriptures. 40-day seminar, Acts 1. And said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. Why did he go and die and rise again? Because the book told him he would be resurrected the third day. Guess what? The Father directly communicated to him, I'll resurrect you the third day. So what does perfect man do? Walks by faith trusting and believing in the Word of God. And in today, rightly divided. 
You see, folks, when we come back to Hebrews, you're, you're coming back to Philippians 2. When, you come, when we come back and we begin to see that the, the son learned obedience, 2.8, and became obedient, he learned from direct revelation of the Father, and he also learned from the written scriptures. And as he fulfills it, remember how the Lord would say, have you not read? If you believed Abraham, you would believe me because he wrote of me. <laughs> if you read Moses and believed Moses, because he wrote of me. When he does all that, he's, he's learned it. Because the limitation of his humanity was such that he had to be taught. That doesn't limit him being God. He's God. It doesn't limit him his humanity. He's 100% human. He just doesn't have your sin condition, praise the Lord. <laughs> what did he do? He became obedient. But 2.8 doesn't just say obedient unto death. Even the death of the cross and we'll look at that next time, and it'll hit you. It, first time I looked at it, it punched me in the stomach of what he goes through, becoming obedient to death. But not just any death, the death of the cross. And as we go through and as we look in Psalms and in the Old Testament at the issues of death and how the unsaved world dies, it'll give you goosebumps if you're human. And it'll make you, cause you to stop and think about the lost that we run into. Because we're reading Psalm 69 and other, so other passages where they're being drugged, he's being dragged down into the mire, into the pit, into the over drowning. And that's how the unsaved die. And you know what? He learned that. He knew he was going to go through it. And because the Father said he's going to taste death for every man, you know what he did? He went and did it. The Father said, you go do that, son, and I'll resurrect you three days later. And the son says, you know what? Not my will, but thy will be done. And he went and did it, did it done it, dude it. And then you got Psalms 2, or I'm sorry, Philippians 2, verse number 9, wherefore God, that's the Father, also hath highly exalted him and given him a name above, which is above every name. Why did he do that? Why does he cause every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God? Why does he do that? Because by faith, he trusted the word and the will of the Father. He never questioned it. He never said, yeah, but what a... And you know what? As a personification of perfect humanity, when we look at that, we should do what? Same thing. Same process. Same thinking process. He learned from the scriptures. He knew what he was going to fulfill. And yet, you know what? He, still, he knew what he was going to be facing, and yet he still went and did it. And he did it for the sinner. He came, but God committed his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, he died for us. That's what he did it for, the sinner. He Philippians 2, 2, 2 3, 4 Jew. <laughs> he esteemed you better than himself. And he went and did what needed to be done so you could enjoy him and his riches and his life. And he does it over here by learning, being instructed. How do you and I do? Same way. So we'll look next time at that death issue. Okay? All right. Dear, Heav Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the morning. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the instructions here that we can see and we can look into and we can rejoice in. The fact that you had provided a redemption program for all of humanity. And then you, got you and the Spirit and the Son executed it flawlessly. And we thank you for that. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, we'll stand. We'll be dismissed with the song.